Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Dr. Henry Ford is a Haitian-born pediatric surgeon who maintains close ties with his native country. He received his bachelor's degree in public international affairs, cum laude, from Princeton University, and sorry, <laughs> from Princeton University, and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He also received his MHA, known as Masters of Health Administration degree from the School of Policy Planning and Development at the University of Southern California. Motivated by a deep desire to have a positive impact on the world and drive important change, Dr. Ford has achieved unprecedented success throughout his career. He has conducted groundbreaking research on the pathogenesis of necrotizing enterocolitis the most common and little disease affecting the gastrointestinal tract of the newborn infants. His work has led to new insight into the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of this vexing disease. He has served leadership roles at medical center around the country, including the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California, the Children's Hospital of Petersburg, Petersburg University School of Medicine in the Children's Hospital Los Angeles. He now proudly serves as the Dean of the Miller School of Medicine at the University of Miami. Dr. Ford is a Fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the Royal College of Surgeons in England, the American Association of the Surgery of Trauma, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. He is the recipient of numerous honors, including the Arnold P. Gold Humanism in Medicine, Award, award from the Association of American Medical College. He is also the author of more than 300 publications, book chapters, invited manuscripts, abstract, and presentations. With all of his accolades and honors, Dr. Ford has not forgotten his roots. In 2010, he traveled to Haiti after the earthquake to provide surgical care to children injured in the catastrophe. Since then, he has returned to Haiti regularly to provide medical care to his residents. In May 2015, he performed the first successful separation of conjoined twins in Haiti, alongside surgeons he helped train. We are thrilled to have him here with us today to share his story and his advice with us. Please help me to the podium to welcome Dr. Henry Ford. Please, to hear all the nice things I have to say about her son. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you, Callan, for rescuing me from wherever I was wandering in this massive campus. It was just so beautiful. Um, and couldn't 
fight to get my bearings. It's an honor to be able to address you. It's really an honor to be able to share uh, with you a little bit about my journey. And I really want this to be as informal as possible. If I have a mic out, I just want to walk around and, and, and chat. And, because that's really what it is. And if there is time at the end, you know, we'll maybe uh, show you a couple of slides and highlight and show you know, what I think is probably the most significant thing I've done uh, in my life. The most daring for sure. So anyway, as you heard before, I, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so I was born in the Haiti, uh, one of nine children, number six of nine. You know, what's, what's up with number six? What's the problem with number six? <laughs> yeah, number six is the forgotten. <laughs> Nobody remembers who you are. Nobody cares. In, in, fact, in fact, it's so bad that there was one summer that uh, my entire family left. Uh, they went off on vacation and, and, and I was left by myself. I mean, you talk about really having a complex, like you were thinking, uh, am I really part of this family? And, and, and the worst place I had to stay with my grandmother, who is absolutely, she was a terror. Um, so, God bless you. So, um, so anyway, so that's that's the deal with number six. Number six means that you have to work extra hard to get recognized because you forgot. And, uh, and and that's basically how it all started um, back in Haiti. And, and I remember you probably would have had me on treatment for ADD. Uh, because, let's face it, I, I, how many people do you know had to repeat kindergarten? <laughs> That's right. That's how bad it was because I just could not get the school thing. I couldn't be serious about it. And, and I just thought, you know, once we got recess, school was over. Um, so I would refuse to go back into class. And so they thought I was not mature enough. And, and then they, so that, I think I went through three different kindergartens. And then uh, the third one, after whenever we had recess, and don't believe, don't don't do what I did. I, I would wait until I saw my brother pass in front of the school because you know he would get out of school. My older brother would just get out early, and, and and whenever I saw him, I would climb over the uh, the, the brick wall <laughs> to go home with him. Uh, so they decided maybe the school thing wasn't for me, so they took me out and, and put me uh, with a tutor, and, and and this lady was just uh, amazing. And she made me sit down in a chair for four hours without even moving. Uh, I mean, I couldn't even go to the bathroom. Uh, but that was the discipline that was necessary to finally get me on track. Okay, once I got on track, it was okay. So my, my dad told us my father was a preacher, and, and, and he taught us the key, the most important principles of life. Faith in God, in that order, in education. And he expected us to do well and, 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 and taught us that uh, even if he was rich, and he wasn't. And by the time he divided the inheritance among nine kids, uh, there would be nothing left, especially for number six. Um, so, so we had to take school seriously, and he said, the only thing I can do right now, or the only thing the mother and I can do is to invest in your education. Make sure that you have the best possible education. And, and so this conversation, I think they had it with me when I was in first or second grade. And, and this is one quality that never left me and really helped shape my path. So fast forward now, I'm about 13, I'm going on 14, and, and my folks decided that it's time for us to leave Haiti to go to um, Brooklyn. And you know, it's not like we have a vote in this process, you know, your parents decide that's what you're going to do, and that's what's in the best interest of the family, and so that's what we did. Uh, so I showed up, um, you know, in September, I think we moved uh, July 22nd. Um, so September 1st, I have to start school. And you know, I don't speak English. And so much so that people, when we are having roll call the very first time, and everybody's calling names and they have to get to me, uh, Henry Ford, and so I don't know what you're talking about, you know, Henri, Henry, Henri, and so, so everything. So, you know, especially when you start looking at number six with, with, with a big head. Uh, so they think I'm slow or, you know, maybe I'm just kind of a little learning uh, impediment or something like that. And so finally one of my Haitian uh, you know, colleagues, uh, another Haitian student, came over to me and said, listen, this is roll call and they are trying to see, you know, when, they, when you hear your name, you have to raise your hand. And I said, well, you know, I didn't hear my name. They said, well, here's your name, yeah, Henry Ford. I said, 
looks like me. I said, of course that's you. And I said, well, you know, the problem is that I grew up in the Haitian system, in the French system, where you are really known by your middle name. So my whole life, it's been H. Ronald Ford. So in Haiti, I was Ronald. And then suddenly, you know, people call it Henry, Henry, Henri, I don't know, that's not me. So anyway, so that, that's how I became Henri Ford. And so he explained this to me, and then ever since I started responding to Henri Ford. But you, my close friends, and I know my real name uh, in the Haitian community, anyhow. So, and that's what my family called Going from Port au Prince to John Jay High School was a little bit of a shock when you don't speak English, right? Um, you know, you were Frenchy, uh, people are picking on you, the football players. They just, they, they, when you go get your food in the cafeteria, they think that that's an extra trade for them. Uh, they just take it from you and you can't even fight back. Uh, so, so the good news about this, uh, you could say, I, this is oh, how bad, how terrible. And it provided to me the impetus, the desire to assimilate faster. So I knew I had to make sure that uh, I learned that language and become acceptable to all of my peers. I remember it was not an easy journey. Now, I gotta tell you, so when I started in English, and, and I decided not to take English as a second language because I wanted to be part of the rigorous academic track. Uh, I knew I was gonna pay for it, but, but the heck, I said, let's try it. So when I started my English class in the ninth grade, we were reading this book called The Outside. Um, every time we got to me, the entire class started bursting in laughter. Why? Because they knew I was about to butcher the English language. I mean, there was not a word that was safe with me. Because I had no idea. I, I didn't have no clue what I was saying. But I had a very good English teacher, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart said, don't even listen to them, ignore them. At least I could figure out that one. Um, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Just keep trying. It's, you know, and, and let me just digress for a second to share one of the things that I teach my, that I tell my children, and this is that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. So hard work will always get you where you need to go. You, no matter how talented you are. But if you combine hard work with talent, you go from good to great. So, uh, so, so, so hard work, very, very important thing. So we kept working hard, and then uh, you know managed to get through uh, English, but you know science and stuff like that was not a problem. Uh, so during the summer, I decided to immerse myself in an intensive course to become more proficient in the English language. And there, something miraculous happened. You know, I was you know, I was reading a bunch of books, and, and and one of the teachers, one of the assistant teachers for that summer was this young woman named Linda Colon. Linda was going into a third year at Princeton University, and, and she took an interest in me and said, you know what, um, you need to start thinking about going to Princeton. And said, to me, Princeton meant nothing. I said, well, no, I have no idea what she's talking about, and no one from my high school had ever gone to that place anyhow. Um, so we continued to work hard, and, and the English class got a whole lot better. In fact, so, it went so well that I ended up being honors English of all that. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah, so hard work. Um, and then, unfortunately, by the, end of, by the end of my junior year, the same football players who were grabbing my lunch trick, guess what? They were my campaign manager because I was running for student government. And, and they were intimidating everybody else to vote for me. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but but it, it's just to tell you about the beautiful story of assimilation. So fast forward senior year, I'm applying to college, and of course, you know, I applied to Princeton, and then God bless, I was uh, uh, accepted, and, and I was excited. That was really one of the happiest days uh, of my life. Uh, I remember just being so thrilled. I ran up to my history teacher, one of my history teachers, and said, uh, Mrs. K, Mrs. K, I got a full scholarship to go to Princeton. And Mrs. K's response was, uh, congratulations. Let's see how long you last. Point number two. It's always about turning adversity into opportunity. Um, this was a wake-up call in many ways. I, mean, I could have been really angry and said, you know, wow, I mean, how could she not share my joy? How could she come back at me at this one? But to me, 
you know, and everything happens for a purpose. I felt this was a warning, a warning from God about what was going to be happening. Because if you thought going from Port-au-Prince to Brooklyn was a culture shock, but going from Brooklyn to Princeton was astronomically worse. I mean, that was the real culture shock because I had never seen that much opulence in my life, right? I mean, I got to Princeton taking the train and a bus, right? My classmates were parking their BMWs, their Camaros, their, their, their Mercedes Benz. I'm like, okay, so, so one of them said, well, can you go to my car? Because you know, she was lost and I was trying to help. I said, yeah, okay, so, so I go to the car. I said, well, where are your parents? And I thought, you know, well, no, this is my car. What's wrong with that? Uh, but anyway, so that's what we went into. And then fast forward, now beyond the, you know, the culture shock coming from, you know, football from Haiti, Brooklyn, now Princeton, we walk into the first chemistry test. To my chemist, a, a colleague over there. How oh, boom! I, I, I think I got my first C in my life. So that's, this disaster. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I just didn't know those grades. You never know the struggling in English, we didn't get that bad. And then I remember what Mrs. K told me, right? See how long you last. And, and for me, it's a fight to the finish. I'm not getting off that trip, right? You know, you're going to take my cadaver off, right? Because I'm not getting off. You're going to get off first. Um, so here is where the game was being played. I knew that in order, in order for me to make the team, I had to bring my game up. So what do we do? Hard work. Hard work, hard work, hard work. And, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and fast forward, you know, everything went well. We were able to raise our game and uh, almost measured in chemistry, but I got wiser than that. Um, yeah, but, but things were working went well. I was really blessed. Um, and I had some great role models who inspired me, others that I saw. Uh, you know, African American students who were really doing extremely well, and they taught me something. So if they can excel, so can I, and I wasn't going to uh, let adversity overcome me. So whatever adversity I encountered, we we're going to just figure out the angle to get at it and uh, overcome it. So um, fast forward, now it's four years, and boom, I get to I get an, an acceptance letter to Harvard Medical School. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was quite quite nice. So, but you know, what, what the interesting thing about it is that now this is the second week of class at Harvard. Yeah. I am minding my own business trying to, you know, absorb all the information. And then I get a note. Uh, someone reaches out to me in the middle of class, so I came to class and said, uh, Dr. Ford, the registrar wants to see you. Say, well, why would the registrar want to see me? This is the second week of class, and I can't be flunking out because we haven't had a test yet. Okay, so, so, okay. so I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm good there. Um, so I walked in, and, and Mrs. Kohler said, um, well, Dr. Ford, uh, <laughs> no, Mr. Ford, uh, I have some good news for you. Harvard Medical School gives a full scholarship to the poorest kid in the class. And uh, Dr. Ford, you have a full scholarship to Harvard. <laughs> so he never paid more to be poor. <laughs> Let me tell you, oh my lord, I said praise the Lord for being poor. Free tuition plus to give you some money to spend. I mean, I mean how, how good does it get, right? <laughs> um, so, so, so that was great. I mean, this is all about, um, right? Remember that. Um, so it was during medical school that I came to understand that, you know, in, in many ways I had a calling. And the calling was to try to make the biggest difference in the lives of others and in my community. And so it was always about how do I make the biggest difference? Which, which uh, specialty was going to allow me to be most in, impactful? So, um, I decided to pursue surgery for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, I liked everything that I experienced, but I felt that with surgery, 
I could take a problem and fix it and see almost instant improvement, instant gratification. So that was important to me. And then I decided that, look, the best surgeons um, are going to be excellent internists who just can operate on top of it. That's really what it is. So you have to be good at everything, including uh, internal medicine, and then just be able to operate. So I thought that that was, I mean, that was going to be fantastic. But then I said, OK, well, even in surgery, how can I be most impactful? This is when I realized that going into pediatric surgery was by far the most rewarding thing I could possibly do. Why? Because, and thank you for asking that question. Um, if you take a little child, a newborn infant, who's got some lethal congenital anomaly, and you fix that, you operate on that child, you fix it, you are adding 80 to 90 years to that child's life expectancy, because otherwise the baby is going to die. If I operate on an 85-year-old person who's got a colon cancer, at best I'm going to give that person another five years to live. So when you start thinking about how you can make the biggest difference in the lives of others, then pediatric surgery is, for me, uh, the most um, excited field of the one where you can do the greatest good. And so that's why I chose it. And uh, uh, truly, there is the old um, uh, adage to say that you follow your passion and you never work with the other life. Uh, it's amazing. That's exactly what it's been for me. And not only am I following my passion, my, my hobby, <laughs> they even pay me for it. <laughs> Go figure. Um, so so that, that's really one of my, uh, another major advice. Uh, to all of the learners and people who are coming through. One of the things, one of the observations that I made during the course of my studies, whether it was Princeton, Harvard, um, or when I decided to go into residency, so I went to, I went to Cornell, uh, the New York Hospital for, for my residency. Okay, all right, good, go, all right. And um, so every time I sat in that conference room. Uh, we had weekly conferences where all the residents attending would come together. I was the only black face in there. Um, and, and I remember that in medical school, I only had one black profession. And, and as I started to reflect on my own career, my own journey, and my purpose in life, I felt that um, I had been blessed with a number of great opportunities. Go to some of the best schools, get some of the best training. And so I felt that I should become an academic surgeon. I should really be involved in teaching so that when others would come through, they would be able to at least identify uh, with the person who was speaking because uh, there was a sense of pride uh, in, in seeing that. So, um, so I decided I was going to become an academic surgeon. So I spent some time doing research in immunology uh, and then eventually uh, did my uh, special, sub-specialization in pediatric surgery. Um, and nine years after graduating from med school, uh, I finally could, you know, put up my shingle. I'm a pediatric surgeon, fully trained. And, and it was really um, an amazing, it's, and it's been an amazing career, right? It's a sacrifice in many ways because I remember my wife would have always attacked me, especially in the first couple of years, uh, because my colleagues who were not really pursuing an academic track, who were not doing research. Um, they were there for every single t-ball game, swing meet, and, and, and recital, soccer game, and, and, and me, I was, you know, I, I would catch me in, I would miss a lot of them, and so forth, and, uh, but that was part of the sacrifice, and I was always told, uh, well, why can't you be like them? Um, why can't you be like they? Because uh, they don't miss anything. Man, you know, and one of the things you learn in life is that um, it's a zero-sum game. For everything you get, there's a sacrifice attached to it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about reflecting on what your purpose is. Um, here I am, I'm one individual who has been enormously blessed attending all these great schools. Um, and, and, and with my ecclesiastical roots, I'm son of a preacher, I always remember that life is not about getting all I can getting all I get and then sitting on the king. It's really about being able to give back. And so that's why I felt that I had to stick with it. And so fast forward now, it's about seven years after I finished uh, training, uh, I've been on attending, and then they made a chief of surgery. And the same people that my uh, wife were admiring, so those are the same people who were coming to me and said, please don't fire me. 
and say, see, 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 it, was, it wasn't bad, I mean, anyway. Um, so, so again, it, it's all part of what happens with the hard work thing. Uh, I stayed at Pittsburgh and became the chief of surgery there. Uh, as I told you, then I got recruited to go to Los Angeles to become the, uh, also the chief of surgery at Los Angeles Children's Hospital and the vice dean of the medical school at uh, USC. Um, people ask me, why did I leave Pittsburgh? Because Pittsburgh was so comfortable, everything was so good. Again, it was about trying to make the biggest difference possible. And in Los Angeles, you had over 3 million children. Uh, just the county of Los Angeles has 10 million people, with 3 million other children. And so if you're in the pediatric business, that's the place to be. And then the other point about it is that most of those children are indigent kids. So for me, it was a chance to not only go there and take care of kids, who needed my services, but also I could be a role model and an inspiration for them to tell them that they too could become the chief of surgery at LA Children's uh, or the vice dean. So, so that was a fantastic experience, 13 and a half years there, um, and which brings me here to South Florida. And why did I leave the seven paradise of LA to come here? Chance to make a bigger difference, but this time it's a chance to come and give back to a university, that means a whole lot to me because my sister was treated at Jackson for you know, extensive burns, had to be life lighted from Port-au-Prince over there, spent six weeks in the burn ICU, and they did a great job. And then perhaps more importantly, I saw the amazing generosity of the University of Miami right after the Haiti earthquake. Um, they really um, just did not hold back on their resources to try to help to alleviate the you know, suffering uh, of the Haitian people. So, so I always felt that, look, if I were ever going to leave LA to, to become a dean someplace and I was not really interested, it would have been uh, the University of Miami, although I never expected that to happen, but just watch that because dreams do come true. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what happened. So, so, so thank you. Yeah. I've been at this for a year and it's been fabulous. It's been uh, a, a great steep learning curve and, and, and I've enjoyed every moment of it. But perhaps the one that's most rewarding is just now getting a chance to be out there to begin to try to inspire other youth, other people with similar background to tell them that um, I expect even greater things from you. We're not just going to settle for Dean. Now. You're going to have to be president of the university, all right? I expect you to be the president, a chancellor, or something even bigger. Because if we're able to go far, that's because we stand on the shoulders of others. I was inspired by other people who told me, who taught me that um, even as an as a Haitian American, there was nothing that I could not achieve as long as I focused on excellence and just let all the stuff fall next to me as just noise. So if there's any take home message, just remember that excellence in performance will transcend all barriers, however artificial they may be, that are uh, created by men or women. Uh, so it, it's all about the pursuit of excellence. It, it, this is what drives me, and this is still the model that I use today. Because don't fool yourself. Just because I happen to be the dean, I'm just another Haitian. I'm another Haitian American. So still subject to the same challenges, still subject to the same scrutiny. And when I go out there, nobody knows who I am. All right? So, um, just performance, I mean to prove yourself every day, that's what we do. So, let me just take a couple of moments to tell you perhaps what's the most significant in my life. Um, the Haiti earthquake really uh, helped put a lot of things in perspective because when bricks were falling on little children in Haiti, as I reflected on my journey, I couldn't help but think that I had been put on this earth to intervene for such a time as this. Why do I say that? So here I was right the day after the earthquake, a uh, Haitian American pediatric surgeon who speaks the language today that's spoken there, um, who has expertise in trauma, expertise in, in surgical infections and critical care. So, so this was in a situation where I could just send money. They needed my skills because they didn't have enough doctors to take care of this. So I remember um, I made the decision that I was going to go. I was actually a visiting professor at, at Duke University at the time, so I called home. And before I could say anything, my wife said, you have to go to Haiti. I said, 
play it. Um, and, and for people who know her, this was not a suggestion. <laughs> this was an, an order from the CEO. Uh, so, so and, and, but the next thing was, how do I get my children to understand, my teenage uh, daughter and son? And uh, <laughs> the craziest thing was, my 18 year old said, they had been watching TV and all the reports and so forth. And she said, uh, Daddy, make sure you take a picture with Sanjay Gupta. Uh, I said, what do you mean? But she's, he's out there doing his reporting and, and uh, you know, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm just going to be trying to save lives. And so I said, Daddy, just do it. You know, lo and behold, actually, 24 hours after I got there, I found myself um, um, operating uh, the uh, Carl Vincent uh, aircraft carrier and a little boy who had the ceiling collapse on his uh, pelvis uh, and basically ruptured his bladder and had not had any surgical care for five days, had not peed, uh, had not been able to walk. And, and so, so we took him from the U.S. Embassy where we were stationed into the, um, um, this the aircraft carrier where they had really modern operating rooms and where I was able to do the operation. So they didn't want me to leave because there were other children who needed surgery, so I stayed on and to do with this case of a little girl, 11 year old, that had a piece of the uh, brick impaled in her skull and ceiling collapsed, and boom, a piece of brick was right there. Now she was getting sick from meningitis. Uh, she was, it, it had been five days uh, since the uh, earthquake. So, anyway, uh, I broke it up into some pieces, and, and then I had to retrieve them, right? But then there was a piece that was lodged someplace where I felt, you know, the only way to remove it was to remove part of her skull. And I said, well, this is really where my neurosurgical skills end. I didn't feel comfortable doing something I'm not trained to do. And then the ship's uh, uh, surgeon uh, had this brilliant idea. She said, you know what, there is a reporter on the island who claims to be a practicing neurosurgeon. Let's see if he's worth a dime. And you know who that reporter was. So call Sanjay Gupta. So, so yeah, 24 hours after I get to Haiti for the earthquake, what am I doing? Taking a picture with Sanjay Gupta. Uh, so, so, so she was prophetic. Anyway, so those were two of the most grueling weeks of my life, but also the most rewarding ones. They taught me that uh, I needed to stay engaged. I needed to try to do something to help to improve the healthcare infrastructure uh, in the country, because if we had had a better healthcare infrastructure, uh, we would not have lost, lost 300,000 lives, and we would have not we would not have had 300,000 people who were, who were just so severely damaged by this. So, uh, so that's what I've been doing, working with um, um, you know, different branches, uh, with the Ministry of Health, but also both the private and public sector and both, and both um, public and private partnership. We try to really improve the health condition, the health care infrastructure to support trauma and people here, and especially pediatric surgery. Can you go ahead and get my the slide up for me? Okay. Um, and, 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 and what I'm going to share with you here is really the culmination of some of the work that we were doing. So this is stuff that I would never have envisioned possible when I decided to go to you know, Haiti to right after the earthquake. Um, but uh, we've been in, we've built enough of an infrastructure uh, that uh, we've been able to do something amazing, which was the separation of country and twins. So I'm going to leave you with that story. Um, so in September of 25, they called me um, to tell me that they had a mother who was carrying a triplet pregnancy, and two of the feet, two of the children are connected uh, at um, the belly. Okay. So this is called unfollow pigs. Um, so there was um, essentially no way to manage them safely in Haiti, and, and you know when you whenever you have triplet pregnancy, the biggest problem is premature delivery. You're going to get premature contractions, and if you deliver too early in a place like Haiti, the baby's going to die because you're not, you're not able to support them. Now you, you deliver a baby at 26 weeks, 24 weeks, see if we can keep them alive at Jackson. But, you know, in Haiti, that baby will die. So, we'll go ahead and to go to the next slide. Um, so, my colleagues, um, you know, asked me what could I do. So, Paul Farmer, who was a very good friend, he said, Fernand, this what I can What can you do? My brother, what can you do for me? He said, the problem is that, I said, Paul, we should try to get that patient, the mother, to the United States. But you know, he said, well, look, I have tried. 
we've, we've looked at all the hospitals, the Harvard hospitals where he is, and Miami hospitals, even my hospital, and they said, no, they, had, they were suffering from donor fatigue. They had given so much already after the earthquake that they couldn't do anything else. And so we were not going to let these kids just die, and so we said, well, can we do something you hate? And, and, and the answer was yes, because of all the work that he had done and the infrastructure that we've been able to build. As, you know, I consulted with my team in Los Angeles and said, well, you know, we can give it a, a, a shot. But the most important thing was to make sure that the, mothers, the, the mother did not go into premature contraction. So we had the plan and everything worked out amazingly. And, and fortunately, in December um, of, um, excuse me, in November of, um, uh, 2014, we were able to do a C-section and deliver uh, the babies um, at uh, 36 weeks and three days. Okay, let's go ahead. And, so this is the this is the hospital. That was a schematic illustration of the hospital. The hospital is actually located in the central plateau of Haiti. Yeah. Okay, and it has a catchment of about uh, uh, 1.2, 1.3 million. But in, pre in in reality, because it's the newest hospital and it's the nicest, most equipped. Everybody from the entire country comes over there, which means that it's always overcrowded. Go ahead. Yes. Um, but you can see it's a fairly modern place. We have a heliport, 330 beds. We got ICU, NICU, and so forth. We have modern casting, and we have solar panels when they work. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, this is Haiti, folks. Uh, but it ultra modern operating. Ultra modern operating. Okay. And uh, this operating room is actually bigger than the one that I had in Los Angeles, or the ones we have in Jackson. So that just to tell you, this is really, really well done. And, and that was going to be a critical advantage for us to be able to do such a separation. Go ahead. Um, so, so I flew to Haiti um, about 13 days after the children were born to assess their viability. And it was one thing to get to the point of keeping them alive and delivering, but then you have to decide, you know, can they really be separated safely, right? Uh, and you can't guess those things. You're going to get prenatal ultrasound and all this. And of course, you know, this is 80, you can't get prenatal uh, MRI or, or CAT scan. Sorry. So here we are. Uh, the babies uh, <laughs> were quite viable. They looked pretty healthy. There was nothing else. You can see where they were connected. They were sharing the belly, and they were sharing the liver and the lower chest. They're xiphoid due to the lower aspect of the thoracic cage, uh, but there was nothing else. So, so I spoke to my colleagues and said, hey, do you think we can do this? I mean, because it's a dare thing. And they said, absolutely, we can give it a shot. So I spoke to the mother. Mind you, at this point, these kids are almost two weeks old. Mom has never helped. Mom refused to even bond with them because you know, the folklore, right? You have a good, healthy one, the one that was not self-connected. These two must be cursed. Uh, you know, people, some of her family members were saying, what sin did you commit? Uh, you know, and then so it's the stuff she went through. She just let them go. So I told the mother, look, I can't give you any guarantee, but I do believe that there is a reasonable chance that we could safely separate them and you end up with three healthy girls instead of just one. And she said, really? You really believe this? Said, I can't guarantee you, but I know that we can try and make this happen. Um, so, you know, she said, okay. And I was going to Haiti pretty much every month uh, to monitor their progress. So I returned three and a half weeks later. And she said to me, Doc, these nurses have no idea how to take care of my children. They're killing them. Because she now had bonded so much that she had taken complete control of the care of her children. And this was really fantastic. It was great to see, even that in and of itself, to see that um, and she, her maternal instinct was all over those two. And, um, and, and she was making sure that they were going to be ready for surgery. We'll go to next. Um, so I continued to go, as I said, and they were progressing very nicely. So by the time I went there in March, I decided, okay, we were going to, um, you know, do the separation by the time they turned six months, which would be May. Um, so put together some teams, and then every week, every week we had a conference call between the doctors in Haiti. So we had the healthcare team, so nurses, anesthesiologists, and so forth in Haiti, and also my team in LA. So we could 
make sure we dot the I's and the J's and cross the T's because separating the country and twin is all about planning. It's all about details. And you have to have it all figured out almost to the minute as to what's going to happen. And that's what we did. So fast forward, mm -hmm. next. Uh, on the 20th, I, I flew down to Haiti with a team of, of surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurses, and respiratory therapists, surgery residents, intensivists. So all these specialists that are necessary to make sure we're going to have a good outcome, and we're going to work with the same people on the Haiti side that we've been talking to pretty much on a weekly basis. This is really teamwork. It was, not, it was important that this was going to be a team effort that included Haitian physicians and healthcare professionals, not just us you know, showing up and um, you know, dropping by to, to save the day. Um, you know, next. So this is how they look. Right the night before surgery, you can see the, well, actually the day of surgery. Uh, they were quite big. Next, this is Marion and Michelle. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, my, my chief nurse. Uh, you can imagine, we travel all night uh, on the red eye from LA and uh, people were tired and, and there was a lot of anxiety, let me tell you. And next, and, and this is me looking real rough. No, no, no. Uh, this, this was the most nervous I've been in my life because this was about the time, it was about the moment we were about to start the operation, right? The babies are now um, intubated and uh, it, it just, until now, I, I had never ever imagined anything that happening not going well. I never imagined failure. Um, and then it just occurred to me, there was a veil that came down and said, suppose one or both of them fail to make it, suppose they die. And just imagine what that's going to do to your reputation, to your career. Remember all the critics are going to start saying, Who did, how dare you think that you could go to a low resource country like Haiti and pull something like this? This is crazy, you know, you're just showing bad judgment. Oh, all those negative thoughts that never ever crossed my mind somehow found their way in there. But you know, you can go next. Um, when, 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 when you go up in the Bible, in the Bible, you know, then, you know so, so this is what our chief anesthesiologist, and, uh, you know, she could sense it and said, let's have a word of prayer. And then once we, when, after I did that, we go ahead next, you know, and other people say, well, what about us? <laughs> so, so, so probably to me, I say, this was the most significant act of leadership, which was to gather everyone. I said, you know, I didn't really care what, who you believed in, what you believed in, so forth, but I know this was our big, hairy, audacious goal. We needed to come together in unison to try to execute this very daring uh, feat we were about to undertake. So I said, we are going to be on one accord, and we're going to pray about it, and uh, so let's lift our hearts uh, and, and mind together. So that's what it was, and then we, we got busy. Uh, so this is it. Uh, this is when... The, um, we put the anesthesiologists, as a, the two Haitian anesthesiologists are up front. They're the ones who actually intubated the patient. This is uh, uh, Dr. Green and, and Dr. Nguyen, who, are, who came with me from LA. Uh, they were basically assisting the Haitian anesthesiologists who actually did the work. Um, and we separated the teams into two. You can see based on the hat, the yellow team and the, and the red team, because once we separate the baby, people had to know where to go. So that's a lot of coordination. And the people with the blue hat were serving both teams. Next. So this is it. The babies are now intubated. Uh, it's almost time to operate. Next. This is the x-ray that shows you where they were connected. You can see the lower chest cavity and then everything else. They were sharing a liver. And we had predicted just about all the things that could go wrong. And in fact, when once we started, uh, uh, the uh, Marion started shunting blood to her sister, uh, so her heart rate went up to 180. The sister's heart rate was normal, like 116, and, and you keep giving Marion blood, but it's going right to the sister because there was a shunt, there was a connection between the livers. So what do you have to do? Operate very quickly. You got to split the livers. Next, and so here we go, just like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, there was, um, you know, God bless everything you guys. It just went extremely smoothly, and uh, you know, and it was really a moment of great excitement. Go ahead. Uh, 
So this was, this was actually right before we started when they were trying to calm me down <laughs> because of the, all the anxiety. Go ahead. Uh, but this is right after. You see the contrast? The anxiety before. Yeah, yeah I couldn't stop laughing. And laughing. And that was right after uh, the separation. This was the admin. Loon is the uh, administrator, so we were just all excited. And by now, my eyes are almost very close. So, this was a mom holding her two babies three days after surgery, mind you. She, they acted like it was just an appendectomy. Uh, this is the Haitian doctor that made the diagnosis, uh, and then all the other, some of our Haitian nurses and some of the nurses who traveled with us, uh, including people from South Florida. And this is the intensivist who kept them going. Next. So, um, once everything started happening, you know, the nose is a big moment of pride for Haiti. So, the um, First Lady, uh, Sophia. Martelli, so she came along with the Minister of Health for a photo op. Um, so, and this is the Haitian doctor who's actually in the chief of surgery over there. The Vital brothers are also Haitian doctors um, who helped um, in the operation. Yeah. So, Minister of Health, First Lady, and next. Uh, not to be outdone, so the president decided that, you know, I want to get in on this too. So he had to show up, uh, so for the, this is, I'm trying to explain to him what happened. So he got his own photo op. So, 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 so that was that. Uh, next. Uh, so this was the babies, the girls, on their second birthday. Got a couple more. Next. All right. Yeah, this are the, those are the triplets. All right. Tamar is the one that was by herself. Uh -huh. Next. And this was the third birthday. And we got one last one. And this is uh, just this, uh, in November. I saw them last in, in January. They're doing exceptionally well. So, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you.